Professor Barabay, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank uh, you, Professor Taylor. Eager to think with you about the, the topic of academic freedom inside and outside the classroom. Great. And uh, I'm eager to do this, of course, because we live in fairly contentious times since November or so. And mm -hmm. uh, university campuses have become hotbeds for, for debate. and, and Not and, for the first time. Not for the first time. And so I'd like to begin by just asking you if there are things you think people are particularly prone to get wrong about this topic, things they routinely misunderstand or, or are confused about. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I think it really happens at the extremes. So for professors and also for, you know, for student expectations, uh, at one extreme there's the sense that you really can't speak out mm -hmm. uh, in a partisan way uh, or deliver an opinion on a controversial matter of contemporary phenomenon or what have you. Uh, where, of course, actually you can within certain parameters. And uh, one topic that has come up lately, uh, white nationalism, for example, which will make some students, especially if they're white, you know, feel defensive. And we actually have faculty here at Penn State who specialize in this, who have done research into various kind of white nationalist phenomena, uh, ethnic nationalisms, what have you. And are they supposed to bring that into the classroom? Of course they are. <laughs> That's their job. This is, the, this is what they do. And they would actually be selling students and I think the general public short if they did not. And if that makes some students, in this case, you know, conservative students feel uncomfortable, they have to say, you know, look, look, this is college. We're going to treat you like adults, not like snowflakes, either on the left or the right. And I say the same thing about liberal students who, who find their sensibilities offended by something that a professor says in his or her area of expertise in the course of the, the classroom. So you have to expect that these are people not just with opinions, I mean the professors, but with reasoned and well thought out work on a subject that makes them valuable and worth listening to even if you disagree with them. The other extreme, of course, is the person who thinks they can say anything in a classroom, uh, who thinks that academic freedom is carte blanche mm -hmm. and uh, would you know, turn a class on art history into something about you know, a class on white nationalism or anything, or rape culture or something, all very important things but not necessarily in our history. And uh, that too, I mean, uh, I should actually read what the American Association of University Professors says about this. I, I brought it along. Okay. Teachers are entitled to freedom in the classroom and in discussing their subject, but they should be careful not to introduce into their teaching controversial matter which has no relation to their subject. Now, you'd think that would be straightforward, but in the wake of the 60s, it was revisited. And in 1970, uh, the AAUP glossed it and said, the intent of the statement is not to discourage what is controversial. Controversial is at the heart of the free academic inquiry, which the entire statement is designed to foster. The passage serves to underscore the need for teachers to avoid persistently intruding material which has no relation to their subject. So that's the bar that shouldn't be crossed, persistent intrusion. Okay. Right. Uh, one question that came up after uh, the election was, you know, some uh, students and some professors discussed the election in class, even if it wasn't a material. As far as I'm concerned, a one-off like that, not a problem. Mm -hmm. You're always allowed to respond to uh, an event, whether it's a natural disaster, a terrorist attack, a controversial election. We're people, and we don't stop being people once we go in the classroom. But you can't totally divert a course mm -hmm. with persistent intrusion of irrelevant material. Good. Thank you. That's very helpful. I think you've already answered my next question. I was going to ask you if there's a, a kind of formula that professors could have in mind as they think about where the bright line is, if there is one. Is it this persistent intrusion? Persistent language? intrusion. Yeah. And okay. again, you know, persistent gives you some wiggle room, but as far as I'm concerned, it, it, it makes sure, and I, I actually talked to, to Provost Jones about this, uh, it makes sure that you don't get caught up you know, running down every last person who said one off-topic thing in a classroom one day. You're really looking uh, on, on the, under the guidelines of academic freedom for people who are basically using their platform and their expertise as an excuse to do something else right. uh, that is not relevant to the class. And that's where I think the line gets crossed. Good. Thank you. So you've talked about sort of sector-wide norms and guidelines that come down from the AAUP, and you've touched on ways in which this uh, affects people here at Penn State. Mm -hmm. I'll just invite you to say a little bit more about how this is registered specifically in, in terms of Penn State's practices and politics. Are there, are there particular controversies or issues that are arising here that, you, that you're interested in talking about? Uh, no uh, really flashpoint things yet. Uh, I think we went through a, a little more turmoil 10 years ago when, when David Horowitz was on our case, um, basically trying to see if there had been bias in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, uh, Penn State did a whole all-campus-wide survey of student complaints. And over 100,000 students over a five-year period 
there were only 13 complaints. Um, and so, of course, Horowitz took this as evidence that you know, we should have a better complaint process. <laughs> um, so I haven't seen anything quite like that. I could go back to that, though, because it unearthed some very interesting material. Mm -hmm. One case in, in particular that is really uh, quite, quite uh, difficult and raises legitimate questions. Right now, uh, what we had last semester, uh, right before the election, was some controversy among the faculty over a new policy, AD 92, which involves participation in political campaigns. And I'm on the, I'm chairing the Faculty Affairs Committee and Faculty Senate, and I basically told my colleagues, this is not a thing, this is not a problem. This is boilerplate. Mm -hmm. This is any nonprofit tax-exempt institution cannot participate in elections, can't endorse candidates, can't work on campaigns, right? It's, it's a firewall. And ours is no different, except that it's hard to tell when faculty are off the clock, mm. right? Mm. We don't punch out. <coughs> so um, there are different guidelines involving behavior in the classroom and extramural speech, uh, speech as a private citizen. For the most part, you have the same rights as a private citizen that you would have if you were not at Penn State. You didn't give up any First Amendment rights when you took a job here. Mm -hmm. uh, however, your special position in the, in the community as a person with some expertise in something also imposes some obligations. Um, at least it's, and now again I'm quoting AUP material, but in this case, 8092 didn't put any restrictions on anybody, but it was kind of nebulous about what was extramural speech mm -hmm. and what was intramural speech. So we actually met with the legal staff and we tried to work this out. And initially their, uh, their question was, I'm sorry, what part of federal law compliance <laughs> don't you like? And we said, well, it's different because this is a different kind of workplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, the things that work in workplaces where it's clear where the work is over and person's not on the job anymore, it doesn't, doesn't really work well for us. So, um, so can I, I thought, can I jump yeah, sure. in just to clarify what we're talking about? So you and I have both had the privilege of, of being on BBC broadcast. So right. if I go on the BBC broadcast and say, I'm Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies in the College of Liberal Arts at Penn State, I'm on the clock, irrespective of what time it is in the day. Absolutely. Right. Okay. But you can still speak as a private citizen as long as you make it clear you're not speaking for Penn State. Right. Okay. So gotcha. even on a Twitter feed, um, I, I use Twitter once every sunspot cycle. I'm not very <laughs> fond of it. But nevertheless, my, my landing page says, the opinions here are mine, all mm -hmm. mine, I say. Um, you cannot, for example, contact or, uh, a congressman um, or any elected official uh, with regard to a campaign using letterhead. You shouldn't mm -hmm. be using Penn State email either. Mm -hmm. If you're speaking as a private citizen, make it as clear as possible that you're not speaking for the institution. Okay. That's really, uh, I think, where um, what people need to know so that all this free speech rights they have as Americans, they, they still retain, they just have to make sure that it's distinguished from Penn State as an institution. Mm -hmm. They're not speaking for Penn State or with the sanction of Penn State. Okay. It's really pretty clear, except in the tough cases. Right? So, um, and the tough cases have to do, I think, not so much with the classroom as with the, the extramural speech. Do okay. you have an example of? I do, well, the Stephen Saleta example at Illinois okay. is, is, the, is the most recent one, a man who was dehired after moving to Champaign, Illinois, and being assigned classes because his Twitter stream was regarded as um, indication that he would be unfit to teach. Mm -hmm. And it was very polemic stuff about Israel's uh, incursion to Gaza in 2014. And some of it, I think, did cross the line into arguably anti-Semitic things. The idea that Netanyahu would appear with uh, Israeli, uh, Palestinian children's teeth around his neck. Um, you know, uh, now, there's no evidence that that has anything to do with his performance in the classroom. But um, we, uh, we do actually suggest that in extramural speech, um, the AUP guidelines speak of professors uh, adopting appropriate restraint and respect for the opinions of others, which we don't always do, I mean, especially when we're pissed off. So there, um, a very, uh, well, a very curious and kind of pernicious Supreme Court precedent came into play. This is Pickering versus U.S., 1968. Uh, Pickering was a crank. Uh, also in Illinois, for whatever reason. And he was the kind of guy who wrote uh, sharply worded letters to the editor of the local paper defaming the local school board. And so school board actually sued him for defamation. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, which held that um, his speech was protected because his claims were so outlandish no one could possibly believe them. Mm -hmm. I call this the crank protection plan. Okay. The, 
ob obverse of that, though, is kind of chilling because it suggests you have less protection the more you know. You're right. And Saleda was an expert mm -hmm. in Palestinian-Israel relations, so the argument was made he should have less protection for these uh, utterances than he would if he were just mouthing off about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, there's a, that, that, that uh, Pickering precedent um, does place uh, a little extra burden on people who have expertise in a, in, a, uh, in a subject to be credible about it. Right. But am I right in thinking that being clear about the thing we just finished talking about, right, the distinction between extramural and intramural speech, helps considerably with this, right? If, it does. You know. I mean, uh, although there too, um, if I post something on Facebook about my committee work, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's extramural, but it's related to something I did intramurally, so there too. That's why we met with the legal staff, to try to just let them know where the gray areas might be. One of the people who met with them is incoming faculty senate chair Matthew Wussner, who's a kind of moderate Republican political scientist. And he said, look, if I'm in my job, if I say, based on his performance in these debates, I, I can't see you know, that uh, Donald Trump is fit for the office. In my professional capacity as a person who works on you know, political science, Am I speaking for Penn State when mm. I'm in the classroom? Mm. Don't I do so with the imprimatur of my being a Penn State professor? So yeah, um, and of course my, my argument is, he, of course he's qualified to say that. That's why he's a professor of political science. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the legal staff needed to know about where that gray area might be for people whose work is directly related mm -hmm. to something controversial. Okay. So I'm going to invite you to, to bottom line this for a different constituency than we've been talking about. We've been talking principally about professors and uh, the folks who consume their work or our work. Uh, but I'm thinking now about students. Mm -hmm. I'm a student in the classroom, and I've got this guy at the front of the room saying things that strike me as, as inappropriate. Um, do you have a kind of bottom line? So persistent intrusion may not be the language that works for Right. Them. It may just be a it's, really opinionated person with a... Right. Well, there, I think they, we're, we're, I would be concerned as a student is if I ever got the sense that uh, the professor, as passionate as he or she might be about a certain line of argument, was totally closed off to anything else. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, couldn't hear it, utterly dismissive. Um, that's a warning sign. And any sense that you will be graded down mm -hmm. or penalized in some way for disagreeing with something you hear at the front of the room, mm -hmm. that too is illegitimate. If it is a reasoned and substantial disagreement. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let me go back to the, the Horowitz days of, of 10 years ago because uh, after he turned up so few complaints, and the complaints were all over the map. They weren't conservative students and, and liberal professors. One is, is a Muslim student complained that her professor was disrespectful of Islam. Mm -hmm. and he didn't see that one coming. Mm -hmm. But you can see what that right. would come up. It's totally right. legit. Um, but the really toughest case, so the next year he encouraged the uh, president and vice president of the college Republicans to file various complaints. Uh, three of them were pretty threadbare. One was interesting. There was a student who had written a paper for an intro um, communications class, mm -hmm. uh, CAS 100, I believe, the, the, the baseline one, where also, this, this, is, this matters also, it was a, a graduate student conducting the class, a person who was herself learning how mm -hmm. to teach in the mm -hmm. process of this. So it was a very volatile situation, and the student was writing on the Danish Muhammad cartoons. And mm -hmm. another student, who was Muslim, objected. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough one to, yeah. you know, the, the student who defended the free speech rights of the, of the cartoonists uh, had a case. Um, but it seemed that the way he was making it was deliberately offensive mm -hmm. to other students. And so, I believe, with, okay, this started with the uh, instructor herself saying, okay, look, I think this is a legitimate argument, but it crosses the line in this sort of tone and so forth. Student felt that they were uh, being um, biased, uh, that this was a biased uh, decision in the favor of the Muslim student and against him. This went all the way up to um, Dean Welch uh, in the College of Liberal Arts. And she wrote um, a very interesting sort of four-page, single-spaced response about um, when is reasoned difficult speech okay? Where and when is it, um, you know, for, when was it okay to be an abolitionist in the South? Um, what kind of speech that outrages can also inform? Mm -hmm. And I came away from that. I read all this because David Horowitz made it available 
the way he does. He was publicizing all this. And I said, you know, this is a really great response. Mm -hmm. He said, I had to wait so many months for it. He said, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. The fact that we got all this done in a year, we reviewed this thing right up from the, from the instructor to the department head to, the, to the, the dean of the college. We took this seriously because these are contentious matters. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what you're here for. That's what college is for. You get to really plunge into a subject. Uh, it, it can be um, one of the things I, I was fascinated by as, as an undergraduate was astrophysics. I still am. So when we say the professors are out for the search for truth, it's one thing to be out for the search for truth about the origin and the composition of the universe. Fascinating stuff, but usually not terribly controversial. People mm -hmm. don't you know, get too riled up about it. Uh, evolution, maybe. Climate change, certainly. Mm -hmm. So the sciences are increasingly are not immune from this. But my attitude is, you know, this is, this is what you come here for. You come here basically to grow your brain. Mm -hmm. And even more importantly, if, you know, it doesn't always work, but it, in my ideal universe, college is a place where you learn to hash out disagreements in ways that don't rip the social fabric, mm -hmm. that actually maintain a civil society, not civil in the sense of polite, yeah. but civil in the sense that we actually agree to keep going, mm -hmm. even through disagreements. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully put. Um, Thanks. I try to sell this view to my students on occasion. Sometimes they buy it, sometimes they don't. I wish I put it as well as you have. Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> um, really, actually reviewing that, uh, I thought the, the David Horowitz thing was a, was a sideshow, um, and it produced something really interesting. Uh, going over the documents about how to handle that complaint about the Muslim, uh, uh, the Danish uh, Muslim cartoons, um, actually suggested to me that in this case we were doing the right thing. Mm. We were actually modeling how to disagree mm -hmm. and how to negotiate different kinds of competing moral claims. Did Dean Walter's response find its way into any policy document? That I don't know. Um, I really don't. I, I think it was just, um, in this case, a review um, of because that of that case because the other sort of internal issue was here we have a relatively inexperienced teacher. Mm -hmm. you know, through us, and this happens a lot in the introductory classes, right? You've got people who just coming onto campus. Sometimes they come from pretty homogenous communities, and this is the first time there's a Muslim student <laughs> within sight, right? Or for that matter, they're coming internationally. This is the first time they're dealing with Americans. And, uh, you know, they're 18, 19 years old, and they're trying stuff out, whether they're trying out all of a sudden they have a trans identity or they think, you know, they're going to be the conservative voice of opposition, whatever it is. And you have uh, people in the introductory classrooms sort of in the contact zone who have to negotiate all that. Mm -hmm. So part of this was the department head having his instructors back. And then on top of that, okay, let's take this to the dean, see what the dean says. And again, the, the, uh, what came out of this was really a sort of model of how to handle something like this in the classroom. And I hope the instructor herself, I think it was, uh, she, but I, I don't know, I'm not covering her identity, I don't know who, who it was. Um, I hope everyone learned something from this, uh, you know, even Horowitz. <laughs> even Horowitz, you Even say. Horowitz. Uh, well, I'm, I'm really grateful to you for sharing your, your time and your wisdom with us. Uh, are there any things you'd like to share with us in closing, things you really want people to be thinking about as they, if they think about these issues? I think there's only one uh, stone left unturned as far as I can uh, think. Uh, because what's subtended the discussion is the idea of expertise. Right? Uh, people are speaking within, if professors are speaking in their area of expertise, they have a little more weight and credibility than students who are just coming to a subject. With graduate students it's tricky because they are accruing expertise, or supposed to be. Um, and that is actually one of the pillars of academic freedom. It's mm -hmm. built on um, the idea that you have had undergone rigorous study in this subject for years. You've been evaluated by your peers. If you have tenure, you've been evaluated nationally or internationally, and that gives you a certain leeway. Um, but again, you speak outside areas of the expertise, just as any ordinary citizen, and when you speak extramurally from your expertise, you should be expect to have, meet a pretty high, high standard. But I'm saying all this in the context of you know, what's happened, not just in, since November, but I think over the last 10 or 15 years, is increasing skepticism in America about the idea of expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's most obvious you know, with regard to climate change, but I think it is pervasive. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make a sort of secondary case, not only about the expertise itself in this subject or that subject, but a sort of meta case that there is such a thing mm -hmm. as real, uh, um, disciplinary and intellectual training that qualifies a person to do this kind of job. And uh, I think, too, professors should uh, take that as seriously as, as they can because, again, we're uh, 
opinionated people on all manner of things. Uh, as an ex-hockey player, my, my opinions on hockey are very well informed, <laughs> but I don't bring them in the classroom, and my classroom work is you know, a thing apart. So I, the, the real uh, struggle I find is uh, even making the case that there is expertise and that it's valuable and that it carries more weight than just ordinary opinion. Right. And that's what students are here to experience and eventually you know, to try to model and accrue themselves. Mm -hmm. Agreed. There's an interesting and provocative book that has come out recently called The End of Expertise that I makes this very point. I was thinking, uh, uh, yes, yeah, right. This is one of our biggest challenges, uh, but with folks like you on our faculty, I think we're well positioned to respond to that challenge. I'll give it my best, man. Right. Thank you. Thank you.